Welcome everybody. I'm going to start a little bit, just a little bit early so I could tell you what the rules are so that everybody remembers. The first thing is, is a CME sort of event. So now it's the innovations and, right, I can't say it. But you'll know because there are places in the back that you can go to. So I want you to enjoy this as much as we've enjoyed this for the last four years. It's the fourth year of the innovations and the that we won't talk about. But I got a group here, they look good, they look primed, and they are ready to go with some great research, some great people in the back doing some wonderful things that we won't mention. And I want you to go back there and enjoy that stuff that we cannot mention. Remember, there's gonna be no discussion except the discussion that you have with them afterwards. And I encourage you to do it, because they put a lot of time into their research. But I promised everybody that we would be out in time to be able to get into our tuxedos and do our black tie stuff tonight. So the pressure is on them right here, these young scientists. There are, uh, we heard about the final four, this is the final 22. Each one rep represents their research and their school. Now last year, I, did, I finished the beer, I had to go all the way back there. So this year I went back, I actually have two bottles so I do not have to break and we can just go straight. Now that's going to be the key. Now remember when they get up here, we will be talking about what institutions they come from. So they're not just representing themselves, but they're actual institutions. And the pressure's on guys, right? And gals, right? So we're going to get started and remember what the rules are. They're going to do it, three minutes. I hope that red one doesn't stop us. If it does, we'll get the gong and we're going to move on to the next one. It's nothing personal. It's just you got to hit the final shot. It's a three-pointer and you got to hit it. So we're going to be able to get that done. We're going to start from the beginning and we're going to start with our first speaker. So let's get started. As she gets up, this is uh, Amanda Nelson presenting congenital blepharoptosis dynamic reconstruction, the Nicaragua narrative of a self-sustaining global health model from the University of Wisconsin and representing Dr. Bence, who's up there watching what's going on. Three minutes, let's take it. Thank you, it's a true pri privilege and a pleasure to be here today. 40 years ago, Dr. David DeBell and his team from the University of Wisconsin traveled to Nicaragua in order to address the need for the backlog of reconstructive surgery. They soon recognized that the demands were too great to be met by humanitarian mission alone, and thus established a residency to train local surgeons in Nicaragua. Under the leadership of Dr. Mike Bentz, the global health model has evolved into a collaboration between two countries and two universities to the mutual benefit of both. Dr. Gustavo Erdosia was the first Nicaraguan trained resident pictured here with Mike Benz, and he has now become a master surgeon in his own right. I'm honored to present his series of 58 consecutive Nicaraguan patients who underwent congenital blepharatosis reconstruction using autologous fasciolata frontalis sling. Two incisions are made above the lash line to expose the tarsal plate, and three incisions are made at the superior brow and extended down to the periosteum. A single strip of fasciolata is then looped from the pretarsal to the preperiosteal plane and back, forming a pentagon configuration. The upper lid height is set at the limbus. Crawford's original description of dynamic reconstruction cautioned the use of autologous fasciolata in children less than three years of age due to concern over leg scarring and insufficient length of material. In our series, this has not been a difficulty. We are able to harvest sufficient lengths of fasciolata in children as young as eight months of age. A common critique of dynamic reconstruction is the difficulty in obtaining post-operative symmetry. In our series, we have no incidence of ptosis recurrence post-operatively, and we have a low revision rate to address asymmetry. Please note the post-operative symmetry and vertical height of the upper lid, and note the longevity of the reconstruction four years post-operatively. While the number of cases completed by the University of Wisconsin residents and staff who go down on biannual medical missions has remained relatively constant over the years, 
the number of cases performed by Nicaraguan trained residents has exceeded 4,700 in total. It is only fitting that this morning I received from Dr. Erdosia a picture of him and his family out on the Gulf fishing. Certainly, the striking adage, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime, holds true. Thank you. Perfectly at the three minute section. Right at three minutes. Okay. So our next presentation is a method for quantifying intracranial volume change by destruction osteogenesis for craniosynostosis by Michael Brendel. So I'll just let you know the first one was right at three minutes. It was almost a buzzer beater right there. Now the University of California at San Diego, right? So That's correct. Is going to take it the next step. There's your three minutes. Make us proud. Thank you to the association for allowing me to present. Distraction osteogenesis is an effective tool for anterior and posterior cranial vault expansion. Previous reports have quantified the volume expansion achieved by distraction. However, there is a need for a standardized metric that is reproducible, can be compared across data sets, can be used to predict volume change, and can be adjusted for normal growth. We completed a retrospective chart review of institutional data from um, including anterior and posterior distraction cases. The metric was defined as percent intracranial volume change divided by the total length of distraction. Here, we demonstrate the metric calculation for 11 unicoronal patients who underwent anterior unilateral distraction. For these patients, the metric was found to be 1.41% increase per millimeter of distraction. We then calculated the metric for multi-sutural patients who underwent posterior distraction, which was 4.16% per millimeter of distraction. This was significantly greater than the metric for anterior distraction. A subset of patients underwent first posterior, then anterior distraction. Again, the metric for posterior distraction was significantly greater. We then adjusted the metric for expected intracranial volume growth, growth using a growth curve from the literature. We're, we were able to do this only for the anterior group as there is a paucity of published ICV data for younger patients. Here, we demonstrate the calculation of the adjusted metric taking into account predicted volume change. The adjusted metric for anterior distraction was 0.50. To demonstrate application of the metric, for example, we can take a patient with a preoperative volume of 800 cc's and plan to complete anterior distraction of 30 millimeters. Using the adjusted metric of 0 0.50, we can expect a volume increase of 120 cc's beyond normal growth. In conclusion, we report a metric for distraction osteogenesis that can be used to predict volume change is comparable between data sets and can be adjusted for normal growth. Further normative data is needed to adjust the metric for younger patients. Thank you. Michael. Very good. Medical student? Yeah. Good job. Thank you. All right. First one was an MD. This is a medical student. So actually, we, if we keep going down, I'm not exactly sure we're going to end up at the end, but probably won't be able to go to the back. So we'll see, but this next one is Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Pathway for Microsurgical Breast Reconstruction, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. Mohammed F. Sabai from the Johns Hopkins sure. Medical School. Is that correct? Yes, I changed my name to Mohammed, but then I'll change it quickly back to get. Mohammed couldn't make it, and so let me just uh, go, go for it. I just wanted to say that right now at Hopkins, doing an, doing an ARIS pathway for a surgical procedure is a super hot topic. So essentially, we could not, you're, you're nobody if you're not doing an ARIS pathway, so we had to do this. So we're going to see if the attending can actually come in. He's already at 241. Come on, buddy. So basically, ARIS pathways are started in the 90s with colorectal and coronary bypass surgery, and now they're being implemented for various surgical subspecialties. And they've been shown to improve postoperative pain, reduce length of stay, and also reduce cost. Several centers have started doing ARIS pathways for various uh, breast reconstruction procedures, but so far there's no true uh, standard uh, ARIS pathway. And we wanted to take a look at microsurgical breast reconstruction specifically. 
So we sought to perform a systematic review of the literature and do a meta-analysis, and we wanted to look very specifically at the ARES pathway patients and what we would call a traditional recovery after surgery pathway patients. Um, so of course, we did the search correctly, and it was very detailed, and we were able to make this very nice figure that when we make a publication, it'll look correct in the journal. And you can trust me that this was done per our uh, librarian, who now they're actually called informationalist, but she knows how to do this, and this was, and it was very impressive to assist with this. So these are the five patients, these are the five studies that we actually ended up using. Um, two of them, the bond from 2015 and 2016 actually shared some uh, patients, and the publication from 2016 was more looking back at how they fixed their ARES pathway. So we didn't use those patients. And the, the, Davidge patient, uh, the Davidge patients were showing how they implemented an ARES pathway and sort of trending over time how many patients actually truly were put on the ARES pathway. So we didn't use all of those patients. But as you would suspect, we showed that length of stay was better. We showed that morbidity in terms of flap loss, partial flap loss were unchanged. Hematomas, donor site infections, unchanged. Pneumonias, urinary tract infections, unchanged. Readmissions and reoperations, unchanged. Pulmonary embolism, DVTs, unchanged. Actually, a little bit lower, and, but not statistically significant. Cellulitis and fat necrosis, unchanged. Boom. So we had a small number of patients, and there was moderate heterogeneity. Um, but it does show that length of stay is decreased and is not associated with increased postoperative morbidity. So we think uh, implementing ARES pathways is a reasonable thing to do for these microsurgical breast reconstructions. All right, Gedge, you right, put us right. all. I was actually a little afraid. The attendees were up here. If we couldn't actually do what the residents did, we'd be in trouble, right? Yeah, I had to read the slides really. That's quick. great. Great. So um, Dr. Sarah Sesso is going to teach us if tourniquet or epinephrine should be used for white week uh, carpal tunnel release. So is Indiana University's second Big Ten school up there, and I feel a little bit bad because our guy in the back, lonely guy back there. Is he that bartender? He's lonely back there. <laughs> Show us what you can do for IU. Thanks for the opportunity to present our work. Carpal tunnel syndrome is a common cause of upper extremity discomfort. Surgical release of the median nerve can be performed under general or local anesthetic with or without a tourniquet. Wide awake carpal tunnel release has been shown to be safe and effective and is gaining popularity. Tourniquet discomfort is a downside in wide awake patients. Local anesthetic containing epinephrine is an alternative means of achieving hemostasis. The purpose of this study was to review outcomes in wide awake carpal tunnel release and to compare tourniquet versus no tourniquet use. Wide awake open carpal tunnel releases performed over a three year period were retrospectively reviewed. Patients were divided into two cohorts with versus without a tourniquet. Demographics, medical comorbidities, operative time, Estimated blood loss, complications, and postoperative outcomes were analyzed. A total of 304 carpal tunnel releases were performed on 246 patients during the study period. The majority of patients were male, and the mean age at surgery was 60 years. Over 30% of patients were diabetic or on blood thinners. A quarter of patients were active smokers. Average preoperative median nerve motor latency at the wrist was 6.8 milliseconds. A forearm tourniquet was used in 30% of cases. Operative time was statistically longer and estimated blood loss was less in tourniquet patients. All other analyzed outcomes were similar between groups. No patients required reoperation during the study period and 92% of patients reported improvement in symptoms postoperatively. In conclusion, operative time was statistically longer and blood loss was statistically less with tourniquet use. However, these findings are not clinically significant. This suggests that local anesthetic with epinephrine is a safe and effective alternative to tourniquet use in wide awake carpal tunnel release. The overall rate of complications was low and there were no major differences in postoperative outcomes between groups. Thank you. 35 seconds left. 
So we'll consider that the first victory for the new IU basketball coach. We'll let him know, actually. He's just sort of come on, and actually within 35 seconds, it's pretty amazing. So we go to another Big Ten school. This is going to be a little difficult for me as a Michigan guy. This is the Ohio State University coming up here. When no news is bad news, improving diagnostic testing, communication through patient engagement, Terry A. Zummerle. Zummerle? Zomerly, yeah, it's Thank a good you. Dutch name. Well, that's a Dutch name. I should know that in Michigan, right? Zomerly, uh, Buckeye. Yes. So, all right, see what you can do for the Buckeyes here. They needed it. Uh, I didn't see them in the 64 uh, this year. Uh, I really felt bad for them. That's a painful topic, but sorry. Let's see if you can actually redeem them somewhat. Of course. All right, thank you for the opportunity to present our research. So our research question was, can we reduce the incidence of missed abnormal test results in the outpatient setting through patient engagement? Um, missed abnormal test results threaten patient safety. Some estimate this to be as frequent as 17% of abnormal test results are missed and not acted upon in a timely fashion. And now this is outpacing wrong-sided surgery as far as incidence. Worse yet, the government's getting involved, and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has a specific measure for the physician quality reporting system specifically centered around re uh, timely reporting of biopsy results. In the electronic medical record, which has been sold to all of us as healthcare providers as a panacea for all things, hasn't improved this. And in fact, it might even have made this worse in that we're missing more abnormal test results and not acting on them in a timely fashion. And the reasons for this, they think there's so many pop-ups, there's so much clicking, we get alarm fatigue, and that we aren't paying attention to these missed results. And our patients are sitting at home saying, oh, hey, I haven't heard from my doctor after my breast reduction about my pathology results, so no news must be good news. And so what we developed was an IRV-approved pilot study. We enrolled consecutive patients who had radiologic, pathologic, or laboratory uh, testing ordered. Um, and we divided them into two groups based on whether they had access to MyChart, which is our secure email system through our uh, electronic medical record. So in our study group, which had 40 patients, we asked them to remind us, said, hey, we ordered these results. When we see you next, ask us about what your results showed. We sent them a written reminder on their AVS, which is this piece of paper you get when you leave your appointment. And then we sent them an email. The control group mimicked our status quo, and we had no intervention. So of the people that we enrolled, they had a similar age between the two groups. There were more males in our control group, and this was significant. And these were our results. Of the 40 people, we said, hey, please ask us about your test results. 60% remembered and asked us about their test results at their next appointment. Uh, in comparison, our control group of 50 patients, a measly two people said, hey, what did my test results show? And these were very st statistically significant. So in discussion, we found that engaging patients in their own care is simple to do. It harkens back to the old time of one-to-one -one communication before the EMR interloper. It uses already existing tools that we have, and this could decrease missed abnormal test results and in turn improve patient safety. So this is the big slide. In conclusion, we found if you ask patients to be engaged in their health care, they will. But obviously, there's room for improvement. Even with three reminders, our study group, only 60% uh, of those group remembered to ask us about it. Uh, so we're asking when you go back to your institutions, talk with your patients, say, hey, help me remember to talk to you about your test results when I see you next. Meet with your EMR people, maybe set up uh, like a MyChart type system or some sort of email reminder. And more importantly, unlike other things that you learn at this conference, we ensure there's likely no Black Monday effect from instituting this change. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, the Buckeye came in under time. We gotta give credit where credit is due. So next. next one is Elizabeth Valpolicelli, uh, long-term outcome of the intermediate cleft lip rhinoplasty. So this is a double teamer here. We have UCLA representing the Pac-10, and we also have Temple, which is the Ameri American Athletic Conference. Which one are you from? UCLA. UCLA. Okay, we'll see how they do. They didn't do, they sort of broke some hearts there, and they didn't quite get to the final four, right? See Close. what you can do to redeem them. Hello, and thank you. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today. No disclosures. The rationale for performing intermediate cleft tip rhinoplasty is to improve facial aesthetics during the most critical period in psychosocial development in children, either right before the start of school or during alveolar bone grafting between the ages of 5 and 10. The goal of this study was to determine if the effects of intermediate cleft tip rhinoplasty last. The senior author's approach for intermediate cleft tip rhinoplasty consists of an open rhinoplasty approach using a composite auricular skin cartilage graft and VY advancement of the cleft side lower lateral cartilage followed by tip defining stitches. 
For this study, we looked at five relationships using measurements from photographs. The five relationships include cleft tip to alar base over non-cleft tip to alar base, alar base width over height, cleft nostril width over height, non-cleft nostril width over height, and cleft medial canthus to alar base over non-cleft medial canthus to alar base. We used pre-op and post-op photographs at these four different time points. Our sample consisted of 28 unilateral cuff flip and palate patients with an average age of 7.1 years. 50% of them were male and 68% of them were left-sided. All relationships were compared using ANOVA with post-hoc analyses using the two key criterion. ANOVA demonstrated statistically significant differences for all relationships except for medial canthus to alar base. For the ratio of tip to alar base, a statistically significant difference was noted between pre-op to post-op of less than one year. There were no statistically significant differences between immediate post-op and any, and any other post-op time points. For the ratio of width of the nose at the alar base to the height of the nose, statistically significant differences were found between pre-op and all post-op time points. There were no statistically significant differences between any of the post-op time points. For the ratio of cleft side nostril to cleft side nostril height, statistically significant differences were found between pre-op and all post-op time points. There are no statistically significant differences in any of the post-op time points. In comparison, the non-cleft side nostril width and height also demonstrated some differences, but no specific trend. In conclusion, intermediate cleft tip rhinoplasty results in improved symmetry of the ala, height of the nose, and cleft nostril dimension. Long-term measurements compared to intermediate post-op of less than one year do not demonstrate statistically significant differences. Thank you. All right, Elizabeth. You did it. Medical student? Soon to be medical student. Okay. She's a soon-to-be medical student, so those people out there keep a watch, okay? The next one, we're gonna actually have two more Big Tens coming up here. So uh, how big is too big? Pushing the obesity limits of microsurgical breast reconstruction. Jamie Spitz, uh, University of Illinois, teaming up with Northwestern. So we are really getting representation here. Great, thank Which you. Which one are you from? University of Illinois. U of I, okay, take it away. All right, thank you for the opp opportunity to present our work this evening. This is quite an honor. Nearly 79 million Americans are obese. As the prevalence of obesity increases, free flap breast reconstruction is becoming a more frequent occurrence. Obese women present with many reconstructive challenges. Um, there is not yet a perfect solution to doing reconstruction in this population. Though some studies have evaluated complication rates in obese women, there is still limited data on microvascular autogenous abdominal-based breast reconstruction in class two and three obese women. We reviewed our experience with patients that underwent abdominal-based free flap breast reconstruction over a three-year period. We categorized women into groups by BMI, and then after controlling for other factors, we analyzed our complications both at the donor site and recipient site. There were a total of 90 women correlating with 117 breasts. Patient preoperative characteristics were similar across the different BMI groups. However, there was a trend towards increased variability across uh, groups with B, um, diabetes. The reconstruction types were also similar across the different BMI groups. This is a patient that fell into class three obesity. Overall complications found a trend towards increasing variability across the BMI groups. This trend was more pronounced when normal and overweight women were compared to those with varying classes of obesity. When looking at subgroups, donor site complications were found to be have variability across the different BMI groups. This was statistically significant. However, recipient site complications were fairly similar among the different classes of obesity and the other BMI groups. Fat necrosis showed a trend towards increasing variability across the BMI groups at the recipient site. When normal and overweight women were compared to those with obesity, donor site complications once again was found to be significantly significant. Recipient site complications was not. However, wound healing at the recipient site was found to be increased in obese patients, as well as reoperation. This is a preliminary study evaluating complications in women with varying levels of obesity that underwent microsurgical autologous breast reconstruction using abdominal donor site tissue. 
We found that class three obese women had similar outcomes to those in class one and class two obesity. Therefore, there is likely no prohibitive BMI for microsurgical autologous breast reconstruction. As providers, we must educate our obese patients about the higher rates of donor site complications and recipient site wound healing complications. Overall, we are able to achieve acceptable results in this challenging patient population. Thank you. Good going. Jamie, you of I. Thank you. Thank you. So the next paper is melanoma. How much does time to treatment matter? So we have another attending coming up here. So the pressure is on because they've all done the right thing. So we're going to have to see. Now, this is Cleveland Clinic, so I don't even know. They, they don't really have a mascot, so I guess we're going to call them the LeBrons. So uh, you are representing LeBron. He brought it back to Cleveland. We'll see what you can do here, Brian. Well, in anticipation of this, here's a small piece offering for you. Yeah. You look thirsty. All right, bribing the judge. I'm not sure if that's going to work. That's an attending move, guys. I also know him pretty that, well. Right, when it's not working, I think he might want to be going over, right? We'll see. <laughs> All right, I have a few disclosures, but none will conflict with this talk. Uh, briefly, rates of malignant melanoma are on the rise. In fact, the death rate is increasing faster than the incidence. The uh, delays uh, in treatment have been shown to affect survival in other cancer groups, but limited information has been provided in melanoma. So, of course, we wanted to aim to identify whether there is such a uh, a concordance between time to treat and uh, overall survival, and we had access to the National Cancer Database, which is almost half of all the U.S. melanomas uh, uh, treated. And uh, with inclusion and exclusion criteria, we had about 150,000 patients to assess, and we used standard statistical modeling. As one might expect, using standard uh, unadjusted variable analysis, uh, there was a time to treat difference in survival. However, that went away when you did multivariable analysis, except and patients treated over 90 days when you compare it to uh, one to 30 days. But our model allowed us to break out specific, uh, specific stages. And when we did so, we found there was actually no difference even beyond 120 days for stage uh, two melanoma, stage three melanoma. So where was the difference? And surprisingly, it was in stage one. Even patients treated 31 days after, uh, uh, 31 days versus less than uh, 31 days had a statistically significant increased chance of dying of their disease. And this got worse as the time went on. Why does this happen? It could be due to the variable of providers. Uh, uh, stage one melanoma is treated by many people besides melanoma specialists. The follow -up may not be as rigorous, and there's a lot of um, controversy in the treatment of it, including whether to use sentinel node biopsy. In conclusion, this is the first study ever to show time to treat affects melanoma, and moreover, the first time ever to show that it does so in stage one, certainly this early in the time to treat initiation period. Uh, establishment of a safe treatment paradigm for these patients, especially stage one, is highly recommended. And as we enter neoadjuvant trials for stage two and stage three, this data uh, forms the basis for allowing us to delay some of the definitive, definitive surgical treatment in order to put those patients on clinical trials. Thank you. That's good, you made us proud. Now, there's gonna be a little information that comes with the next one that I didn't even know. So the next paper up is um, Pediatric Juxta Epiphys... Epiphys... Oh, man. Epiphyseal. Uh, see, another, there you go, thanks, epiphyseal buddy. fractures. Epiphyseal phalangeal fractures are distinct from Salter-Harris fractures and more frequently need operative fixation from St. Louis University. But right before you go, I found out that the mascot, does anybody know this? this mascot for St. Louis University? The Billikens. Right, I didn't know that, yeah, actually. And there's no other school that has a Billiken as a, uh, as a mascot. It's true. It's that's, pretty ugly. So. That's right, pretty, yeah. <laughs> it's good luck, though. So are you going to need it? Let's see. Three minutes, let's see what happens. Make those Billikens proud. Thank you. So you get a call from the Pediatric Emergency Department regarding two patients with hand injuries. What do you see? At first glance, they both look at, like Salta Harris two fractures. But if you look closely, the patient on your right, there's a small rim of bone and the fracture is actually one to two millimeters distal to the growth plate. This is called a juxta epiphyseal fracture um, or a JE fracture. There you go. The purpose of our study was to determine is there a difference between these two fracture groups in terms of incidence, patient demographics, mechanism of injury, radiographic angulation at presentation, and ultimate treatment. So we performed a retrospective study over five years of pediatric patients who presented to our children's hospital with a phalangeal fracture. We were able to analyze 158 patients with either a juxta epiphyseal 
or a Salter Harris II fracture. We use Campbell's lines as, sh as shown here to measure radiographic angulation. What we found was Salter Harris II fractures were more common than the JE fracture group, making up 83%. As you can see, there's no difference between the age, the mechanism of injury, or gender between these two groups. However, it is interesting that the JE group presented with significantly more radiographic angulation, 20 degrees, as compared to the Salter Harris II group with only 11. When we looked at the stability of these fractures after attempted close reduction in the emergency department, we found that in the Salter Harris II group, 88% achieved stable reduction. However, in the JE group, only 46% achieved stable reduction, meaning more than half the patients required going to the operating room. Next, we wanted to see what percentage of patients actually needed surgery. In the Salter Harris II group, 13% went to surgery. However, in the JE group, 63% of patients went to surgery. Lastly, we wanted to see what, what percentage of patients actually needed closed reduction and percutaneous pinning. In the Salter Harris group, only 8%. However, in the JE group, 52% of patients required K-wire fixation. Our final angulation was great with, for both groups. In conclusion, JE fractures are distinct from Salter Harris II fractures. They are less common. They present with significantly more radiographic angulation. They're less stable when you treat them with closed reduction alone. And they require more operative fixation, usually with closed reduction and percutaneous pinning than Salter Harris II fractures. This distinction is important for us to recognize in order to treat our patients appropriately and get excellent results. Thank you. Very good. Very good. One second. So just for everybody that, you know, because I didn't know, so I'm not in the know. The Billiken is a mythical good luck figure who represents things as they ought to be. And he did a great, great job for the Billikens. We got another attending coming up. So Dr. Granick will be presenting biofilm management attack the matrix with ultrasound. So the Scarlet Knights, another attending. You're representing the Scarlet Knights, another Big Ten school. Good afternoon. Here are my disclosures. Let me get straight to the point, in case I don't make it to the end. Direct contact, <laughs> low-frequency ultrasound disrupts biofilm. Planktonic bacteria results, and these are viable at the settings that we use in this study, and hypochlorous acid kills all of the planktonic bacteria, and the implications for treating metallic implant infections are significant. Uh, essentially, we used a uh, common uh, debridement device used for management of soft tissue wounds and bone. Uh, the mechanics are that there's a console. Uh, the console generates an electrical signal of uh, 22.5 kilohertz. Uh, the handpiece, which receives the signal, has uh, piezoelectric crystals that convert the electrical energy into mechanical uh, vibrations that are transmitted through the tip. And because uh, ultrasonic energy requires an irrigation device in order to couple the energy to the uh, treatment sites, uh, there is uh, uh, some saline that goes through the central portion. Uh, there is a vacuum to remove the extra fluid. Ultrasonic basics, essentially there's a tip frequency of 22.5 kilohertz. Uh, amplitude in the study was 113 microns. Uh, human sound perception peaks at about 20,000 kilohertz, which means you don't hear this device. There's no sound that you can uh, detect. And uh, it actually works by two things. One is microcavitation. Uh, the oscillations create micro bubbles in the tissue, and the bubbles collapse and release mechanical energy. This also creates uh, micro streaming. Uh, the acoustic pressure waves uh, also displace molecules and can cause uh, a lot of significant damage. Uh, this has been shown for bacterial cells. And what we did in our particular study was look at staph epidermidis. Uh, staph epidermidis was grown as a biofilm on metallic discs, either uh, uh, titanium alloys or stainless steel. Uh, we treated it with probe and stained the discs afterwards uh, with crystal violet, which picks up the uh, matrix of biofilm. Uh, the ultrasonic treatment, you can see there's no biofilm left on these discs, uh, according to the uh, crystal violet stain, whereas on the control situation, you can still see the stain. Uh, the protocol considered uh, a control, which we just talked about, saline plus ultrasound, hypochlorous acid plus ultrasound, and uh, we treated them for 10 seconds at two millimeters uh, in small bacterial wells. Uh, the control showed that the biofilm persisted with minimal bacteria in the effluent. Uh, when we used saline, we disrupted the biofilm completely. However, we could culture out viable bacteria, and that's what this particular petri dish shows. Uh, however, when we used hypochlorous acid mixed in with it, we disrupted the biofilm, and there were absolutely zero, no bacteria in the effluent. 
So getting back to the point, direct contact, low frequency ultrasound disrupts biofilm. Viable planktonic bacteria are released uh, with the settings that we used in this study. Hypochlorous acid kills all planktonic bacteria and metallic implant infections. And here we are, Steve. I have a big 10 slide, but I didn't bring it. I didn't realize I was such a all fanatic. Right. Scarlet Knights. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I was a little worried there. He had like 40 seconds left and it was on like results. So, but uh, as the true attending, he actually walked it right in there. We got a triple team coming in here. The use of liposomal bupivacaine in patients undergoing abdominally based autologous and implant based reconstruction. Michael DeLong, right? I got the wrong yes. wrong with Muhammad the last time. So yeah, Gina work. couldn't be here, so. Yeah, uh, that's right. <laughs> the woman thing, I could probably figure <laughs> out the woman man thing. This is the Bruins, UCLA, Michigan, the Wolverines, and the Big Ten, and the Temple Owls, all triple team on this one. You ready? I am ready. Take it away. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, we have no disclosures. As we're all probably aware, the opioid epidemic is a huge problem in the United States, but we have to balance this against the challenge of controlling our postoperative pain in surgical patients. Um, while narcotic medications can provide excellent pain control, they're associated with several adverse events or uh, adverse effects, including in extreme cases, you know, addiction and death. And so physicians have adopted multimodal therapies uh, trying to control postoperative pain, including things like non-steroidals, regional blocks, and local anesthetics. However, local anesthetics are uh, limited by their short duration of action, which prevents them from providing adequate postoperative pain. And so uh, that has led to the development of a liposomal formulation of bupivacaine that can persist in the body for up to four days. And so we asked, what effect does this liposomal bupivacaine have on postoperative pain control in patients undergoing breast reconstruction uh, as measured by their narcotic usage postoperatively? And so we performed a pilot study between August 15 and February 16, looking at all of our flap and uh, tissue expander patients. These were all immediate breast, uh, breast reconstructions. Uh, they received liposomal bupivacaine intraoperatively. Uh, it was injected into the pectoralis muscle, into the intercostal spaces, and into the sub-Q around the drain sites and the incisions. All of our flaps receive a tap block. That's their standard protocol. And then we gave them PCA and PO pain meds postoperatively uh, per our standard protocols. And what we found uh, when comparing it to historical controls that we've published previously was a significant reduction in postoperative narcotic usage. So the red is the group that didn't receive Expirel, our historical control, and the green is our uh, pilot study group. And so this is on the y-axis morphine equivalents for IV medications and autologous reconstruction. You can see that there's a significant reduction. The same trend was seen in the implant reconstruction IV medications, autologous PO medications, and implant PO medications. So we felt that since patients were requiring less narcotics postoperatively, we could change our postoperative PO regimen. And we did that in March of 2016. So we're presenting the 180-day implementation data uh, from March to August with 22 flaps and 28 tissue expanders, once again, all immediate breast reconstruction. They received liposomal bupivacaine, the flaps received a tap block, and we have changes to the post-op pathway. So for our standard post-op pathway for flaps, uh, patients receive a PCA until post-op day three when we oralize them to a pain regimen. We switch that to post-op day two. On our tissue expanders, uh, they used to receive a PCA overnight the first night, and then uh, DC on post-op day two, we switched that to post-op day one. And so as you can see, and there was a reduction in our flaps, although we usually like to keep these until post-op day four anyway for flap monitoring, but certainly in our <laughs> tissue expander uh, patients, there was a trend towards discharging earlier. And then just quickly to go through, we also Michael, gave them pain surveys. Michael, sorry. Uh, oh, my God. The first one. Oh and they God. all had significantly uh, better satisfaction. So decreased Ooh. length of stay, decreased narcotics usage, more satisfaction. Wow, three teams, three teams. I'm sorry to upset Very you. interesting. No, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next one uh, we'll have to bring up here. Just you or me. Okay, it's all right. So next one is a novel oral anticoagulants in microsurgery review by Amy Yao. So uh, we have the Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai. And of course, I don't know if they'd be the Moses. What, what we're the Carl Icons, actually. What are you? The Carl, Carl Icons. Icons. Yes, the Icons. We have a team of Carl Icons. That's right. It, it's a Trumpism right now, isn't it? Yeah. Important. But we do have one, the Sackler School of Medicine, Tel Aviv. I don't know. But I do. We, we actually have, uh, we've actually consulted the internet, and it's Donnie the dog. That's what my people came up with, Donnie the dog. 
Okay, you get that? Amazing. Right, they're representing. I don't know who Donnie is, but I like the Moses better. But why don't you take us and make us proud, okay? All right, sounds right. good. Okay. All right, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Amy Yao, and I'm from Mount Sinai in New York. And we have no disclosures. The primary prevention of thrombosis is one of the chief concerns of microvascular surgeons. The bulk of prevention relies on using good surgical technique. However, many surgeons also use some prophylactic anticoagulation therapy to help decrease the risk of thrombosis post-op, usually using agents such as heparin or warfarin. The novel oral anticoagulants, including dabigatran, rivaroxaban, and apixaban, have been FDA approved in the past five or six years and have been shown to be as safe and effective, if not more so, than the currently used standard agents. In addition, compared to heparin and warfarin, the NOACs have a more predictable dose-dependent effect. They require no routine laboratory monitoring, such as INR checks, and they have a documented lower risk of severe hemorrhagic complications. However, they are limited by a lack of laboratory markers to quantify just how anticoagulated your patient is, and they have few specific approved antidotes to reverse the anticoagulant effect. So the goal of our study was to summarize the existing literature on the use of NOACs in microsurgery specifically. Here is a simplified version of the coagulation cascade. The H's here represent the mechanism of action of heparin, which works on the intrinsic pathway. And then warfarin here works on the extrinsic or the tissue factor pathway. In contrast, the NOACs are either direct factor 10A inhibitors or direct thrombin inhibitors, so they work to block more of the final steps of coagulation. So in our review, we found seven papers describing a total of 55 procedures of patients who underwent microsurgery while concurrently taking one of the NOACs. There was a very wide mix of cases from many different specialties. Some of them are listed here. Um, but overall, adverse events were very rare. They happened in only two cases of the 55, both of which were mild hemorrhage that was easily controlled with the pressure dressing. And the risk of bleeding did increase with concurrent dosing of NSAIDs or other anticoagulants. So to conclude, the NOACs are becoming more and more popular and are likely to increase in prevalence, largely due to their safer side effect profile and ease of administration compared to heparin and warfarin. Our review suggests that they may be safely used in microsurgery, however, this benefit is still theoretical um, given the very heterogeneous case mix and small sample size of our study, as well as the overall lack of consensus among microsurgeons about the use of anticoagulation. However, as these are very um, powerful agents with a lot of potential in uh, surgery, there is a need for studies um, of their use in microsurgery to establish management guidelines. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Good. We're back on time. Right, so not exactly like a Jewish goodbye, actually, that would actually take much longer, but you did a great, you did a wonderful job there. Yeah. So we're going to go to the next one here. To operate or not, surgical decision making concerning the spectrum of orbital frontal deformity associated with a metopic suture closure by Min Zhao Cho. This is both from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and Texas Tech. Because Southwestern doesn't actually have a, which one are you from? Oh, we're part of UT, so long arms. Longhorns, but it turns out Texas Tech, though. Do you know Texas Tech? Uh, no. The Masked Rider. That's actually pretty, pretty nice. Masked Rider. I guess if you're... No, no, the, but the, actually, according to our internet, please. It's the Rider. Sorry. It's the Rider. You are the Red Raiders, <laughs> but actually the mascot is the actual Masked Rider because they were the first ones to actually have a, a, live, a live horse, because it's a dead horse, right, onto the field that they rode a live horse onto the field during a football game. So that's why it was the mass rider at the time. I'm sure you're really interested in this. So we're gonna take three minutes. <laughs> she's looking at me completely bored. Uh, that's fine, I'm sorry. But you still get three minutes, so we'll okay. go for it. Make them proud. Perfect, good evening. It is very important for clinicians to distinguish between the patients with true metopic stenosis and those with metopic uh, ridge because the latter does not require surgical correction. Therefore, we developed a machine vision algorithm capable of separating these clinical entities automatically. CT images and 3D MD scans were collected from 43 patients seen in the clinic for either benign metopic ridge or true metopic stenosis. And custom MATLAB algorithm was used to create curvature maps of each head shape. Here's a typical curvature map of a child with true metopic stenosis. The the algorithm calculates the curvature of the, every, of the surface at every point, assigning a color based upon the degree of the curvature. Highly curved surfaces show up in red, which we respected at the midline metopic ridge, 
and the blue areas are flat, which would be expected at lateral superorbital areas. Then the algorithm calculated curvatures of two regions of interest, mid forehead strip, and superorbital areas. The surgical treated groups is shown on the red bars. As expected, the mean curvature in the area of metopic suture is larger in those who underwent surgery. But note that only in the surgical treated group was there a concavity on the lateral supraorbital areas. These findings were highly statistically significant. This slide represents our take away results from our work. Forehead curvature is placed on the x-axis, and lateral orbital rim curvature is placed on the y-axis then all 43 patients are placed on the plot. The triangle shapes represent the patients that underwent surgery. The circular shapes represent those who are treated conservatively. Then the algorithm uses cluster analysis to determine whether any particular patient has true metopic stenosis or benign metopic ridge. The triangular outlines appear around the patients that the machine judged to be true metopic stenosis, and circular outlines appear around those, the patients that the machine thought was a benign metopic ridge. There were over 96% agreement between the findings, except two patients. In conclusion, the algorithm demonstrates different morphology between two different clinical groups. Until the surgeons can agree on the indications for surgery, such algorithm may be useful and helpful in assessing which should undergo treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cho. That's wonderful. You got the next one? Yeah, sure. So, um, Philip Wu from uh, UMichigan will be talking about uh, <laughs> virtual and robotic hands using neuroprosthetic signals from regenerative peripheral nerve interface in human subjects. I'm completely objective. Go blue. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, today I'll be talking about restoring fine motor skills with regenerative peripheral nerve interfaces. Um, so, there are approximately around 500,000 upper limb amputee patients in the US. And uh, even though we have advanced uh, prosthetic hand technology, uh, there is no good way uh, for these patients to control these hands. So to address this problem, we've uh, developed a, a regenerative peripheral nerve interface at the University of Michigan. Um, this is basically based on the same premise as target muscle re but taking it one step further. Um, instead of transferring the whole nerve into the whole muscle, we actually take a partial small uh, muscle graft and place it uh, at the very distal end of a transected uh, nerve branch of the amputated nerve. Uh, and this gives us some useful advantages. Um, first, so there's no rerouting of the nerve, and also we do not need to uh, cut the nerves at the level of the uh, chest muscle. Uh, this makes the surgery less invasive, and also uh, the surgery can happen at any level of amputation. Uh, second, we can potentially uh, divide the nerve into individual fascicles and create multiple RPNIs um, to obtain uh, uh, more independent control signals. And lastly, we can uh, implant or gain stable EMG activity by implanting intramuscular electrodes into the muscle belly of these RPNIs. So uh, as of today, we have 130 patients uh, implanted with these RPNIs uh, for, to control neuroma growth initially. Um, but of the 130 patients, we, have, um, we recorded EMG activity from four of them. Um, today, I'll be talking about our first, very first patient who has, uh, who's a distal transradial amputee and has three RPNIs uh, located uh, as radial, median, and ulnar uh, nerve. Uh, so we use fine wire, percutaneous fine wire electrodes to uh, record EMG activity, and we use ultrasound to find and locate the RPNIs and implant electrodes. So here are just a couple of videos. So uh, using these signals and some machine learning te uh, techniques, we're able to predict the patient's intended movement. So uh, the one on the left is the patient controlling a touch bionics eye limb, uh, and he's able to control uh, his thumb, middle, and little uh, flexion. And the video on the right is uh, a similar task, but he is controlling a virtual version of the modular prosthetic limb. And uh, so the algorithm used on the right is actually a little bit faster than the algorithm used on the left. And the patient actually uh, showed that he would be super interested in controlling a myelectric can if it worked just as fast or as fast as the algorithm on the right. 
Um, these are just some examples of the RPNI signals that we were able to record from these electrodes. Uh, so the first two rows, or top two rows, are the, uh, or the EMG activity recorded in the ulnar and the median RPNI, and we're also able to record EMG activity from uh, intact muscle. Uh, this work was funded by the Wallace Coulter Foundation and DARPA Haptics, and uh, we hope to make uh, further progress in the near future. Thank you. So I just want to read a text I just got because I've been uh, accused of home cooking here. Uh, cheat didn't start the clock. I have no control over the clock, but we could have a Wolverine back there. I don't know whether or not that's true or not. We had a slight glitch with the clock. Who would could have thought, right? It was not pre-planned. No, no, no. That's right. We didn't talk about it before, right? Yes. We will have a Senate investigation. There'll be a House investigative committee and actually also a Senate, but we'll get to the bottom of this. All right, the next one is the extensor pollicis brevis subcompartment characteristics in the first dorsal extensor compartment, an anatomic and radiographic study uh, with the presenting author, Brittany J. Bihar, who's a Nittany lion. Do you know why they're called Nittany lions? What's Nittany? It's a mountain. It's a mountain. State that, college. She knows her college. Yeah. Okay, Big Ten, take right. it away. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Decurvain's tenus synovitis is a common complaint encountered by hand surgeons secondary to swelling within the first dorsal extensor compartment. This causes pain with firing of the compartment's tendons, extensor pollicis brevis, and abductor pollicis longus. Many patients' symptoms are relieved with steroid injections into the sheath and splinting, but some are refractory to non-operative treatment and ultimately require surgical release of the first dorsal extensor compartment. Previous studies have shown that 33 to 58% of D. Curvain's patients have an intervening septum separating EPB and APL. Those with an EPB subsheath are more likely to fail injection trials and ultimately require surgery. Our objective was to determine if wrist radiographs reliably predict the presence of an EPB subsheath. X-rays were taken of 10 fresh frozen cadaver arms the first dorsal compartment of each were dissected to reveal that four had a thickened EPB subsheath, two of which originated from an osseous ridge. In the two specimens with thick septums and bony ridges, the three view x-rays suggest that the subsheath osseous ridge is visible. In specimens with thickened septums but no osseous ridge, we were unable to identify any unique landmarks on radiograph. The ridge was most prominent on AP and oblique views. We then performed a retrospective review of patients with Deeker veins, tenus synovitis, treated at our institution. Patients who underwent surgical release of first dorsal extensor compartments and had preoperative AP, lateral, and oblique wrist radiographs were included. Patients without documentation of the presence or absence of an EPB subsheath were excluded. Three blinded musculoskeletal radiologists, after reviewing the cadaver arm x-ray examples, examined these patients' wrist x-rays retrospectively for the presence or absence of an osseous ridge. They identified a ridge 44% of the time with an inner rater reliability of 0.33. The radiologist's interpretation that an osseous ridge was or was not present correlated with the intraoperative findings of an EPB subsheath presence or absence 48% of the time. Our study shows that most EPB subsheets are thick and well-defined, and standard AP and oblique wrist x-rays can help identify an osseous ridge in the first dorsal extensor compartment if it is present. Wrist x-rays obtained during the workup for radial sided wrist pain can be used to screen for an osseous ridge, which correlates with the presence of an EPB subsheath. Patients with an osseous ridge and who are refractory to steroid injections may benefit from earlier referral for surgical intervention. Thank you for the, your attention. So the next one is the increased incidence of symptomatic DVT following lower extremity flap harvest for abdominal and perineal reconstruction case review. How many people here know who the, uh, what the mascot is for the Johns Hopkins Medical School and the Johns Hopkins University? The Blue Jays. Blue Jays, correct. All right, want to fly in there and make them proud, okay? All right. Thank you very much. Um, Post-surgical venous thromboembolism is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality, and without chemoprophylaxis, of anywhere from 40 to 60% of orthopedic surgery patients will have a VTE. Now, the current chemoprophylaxis guidelines for plastic surgery 
are largely extrapolated from those for the American College of Chest Physicians. And without chemo or with appropriate chemoprophylaxis, the VTE risk can be mitigated to less than 5%. However, does lower extremity flap harvest present a different risk profile? And we would say, how could it not? You have manipulation of vasculature, alteration of venous return, comorbid conditions. So this led our group to investigate the incidence of symptomatic VTE in these patients undergoing unilateral lower extremity flap harvest. We wanted to compare this in two main cohorts, an internal control group, and that is the contralateral non-operative leg, as well as the external control group, and that was a comorbidity matched control group. And we hypothesized that the incidence of symptomatic VTE would be higher in the flap reconstruction group when compared with no flap reconstruction, and higher in the operative leg when compared with non-operative intervention. This was a retrospective cohort study with 127 patients undergoing unilateral lower extremity flap harvest and 60 comorbidity matched external controls. 70% of patients had reconstruction for an oncologic defect, and the main flap utilized was the ALT flap. When we look at our results for flap harvest versus the external control group, we note that 126 flap harvest patients, there were 15 total episodes of VTE. In our comorbidity matched controls, we only had four episodes of VTE. On regression analysis, the odds of VTE were nine times higher in the flap harvest group. Furthermore, when we look at our internal control group, we note that there are 10 episodes of ipsilateral uh, VT formation and five episodes of contralateral VT formation, and that the odds were higher, however, this was insignificant. And finally, Caprini score greater than six was independently predictive of VT formation, and that flap type did not predict VT incidence. So to conclude, the VT risk in these patients is high. It's greater than 9%, and that's with chemoprophylaxis, and nine times higher than comorbidity match controls. And advocate for routine surveillance in the first week three weeks may be indicated. Finally, extended prophylaxis versus prophylactic intervention in high-risk patients may be indicated. Thank you very much. We're doing great here, guys. Let's go for the next one. Okay, so late-shaped distortion after spare mammoplasty secondary to seroma-induced scar contracture by Michael Eichhorn. So this would be the Grand Rapids Medical Education and Partners in Grand Rapids, but you know who you're a part of, right? Don't tell Hammond that. Don't tell him we're Spartans. Ah, he is, that's right. No. So he I don't like know, that. it was harder for Ohio State, so we got them up here. I can say the Spartans, actually, because they're our little brother, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Technically. Yeah. And I just found out I'm a master writer. I was a master writer for eight years, so thanks for letting me know. All right. Um, all right. Thanks for having me. Um, here's not my disclosures, but Dr. Hammonds. Uh, this is the uh, short scar periareolar peri inferior pedicle reduction. Um, you may be familiar with it. We've got our inferior pedicle, crescentic skin and gland excision. The uh, inferior pedicle is advanced up, and then there's a purse string suture. So this is a typical patient that had a spare. And you can see the aesthetic breast shape, the small scar. Now, when Dr. Um, Hammond started doing this you know, 18 years ago, he started to notice a very rare complication. It was unusual. He'd never seen it before. Um, some of these patients, months later, in, uh, even weeks, developed a, a late contracture. They'd be fine at the post-op visit. And then later on, uh, a week later, they have this. Uh, or excuse me, a month later, they have this. So kind of a retraction of the nipple. You can see on the lateral portion, kind of pulled in towards the pec fascia, uh, increased upper pole fullness. So we saw this a few times, um, and actually the third time he saw it, he ended up operating on it. And this is what he saw. Um, it's basically a seroma uh, that's developed over the inferior pedicle in a crescentic shape, it kind of developed some scar around it, and then pulled the breast parenchyma towards it. This is it uh, divided. You can see the thickened walls. And also, you can see it here above the breast, just for kind of some size comparison. So we decided to do a retrospective review of this to find all these patients. Um, also, literature review for similar complications. Of 747 spares over 18 years, we found 16 of these patients that had it. Seven of these breasts actually resolved without operative intervention, and nine of these breasts required seroma scar excision. Uh, we did find the ones that required surgery had smaller resections and lower BMIs. The mean time of onset was 73 days, and the mean follow-up time was 20 months. So these were happening you know, much later on. The non-operative group, um, they all resolved. In the operative group, one patient had a recurrence. Percutaneous seroma aspiration was tried in seven out of 29 breasts, but three out of seven ultimately required surgery. So this is just a patient we saw before. Um, she's a 21-year-old 20, female, right breast contracture, and here she is two years later. You can actually see this. Uh, this actually resolved itself without surgery. But here's a patient that actually had bilateral breast contracture, quite severe. Uh, this developed at one month, and she actually required um, operative seroma excision. Uh, here she is after seroma excision about eight months later, so this actually resolved it. 
Now, if you look in the literature, the seroma rate varies widely, zero to 6%. We reported 2% earlier. Um, only one similar complication of this is a Y scar reduction in the literature, so it's very, it's not very reported. Um, so we feel kind of it's an underreported thing. We want to bring attention here to it. Uh, seroma formation after spare, it can progress to scar contracture and distortion. Persistent breast deformity requires excision, and any kind of minimiz minimization of dead space will prevent seroma scar formation. Thank you. Good job. All right, the Spartans and the green actually come in under time. So the next one, we're going to actually have some Big Ten uh, competition. Uh, the pedicled superior gluteal artery perforator flap for coverage of sacral pressure ulcers. Clinical review and technical considerations. Tamara L. Kemp, University of Washington and University of Colorado. So we know they're the Huskies and the Buffaloes, but back there, there are, th there are at least three attendings up there from the University of Washington. So what is the name of the Husky? Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm not giving you easy ones here. So there is a name of the Husky, according to the internet. It's not just the Huskies, but your mascot is named, what's his first name? We're going to wait on that, but we're going to let you go and see if you make him proud. Stay within three minutes, and then we're going to see if they can name the Husky. Do not go. go to your internet, guys. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity. The ASCAP flap arguably embodies the key principles of pressure ulcer reconstruction with a simple yet flexible design, reliable perforator anatomy, quality soft tissue and bulk, and minimal donor site morbidity with the potential to re-advance or re-rotate the flap if needed. To determine how this flap fares in comparison to other gluteal-based flaps, I performed a review of all sacral ulcer reconstructions over a 20-year period at the Puget Sound VA. The following data was collected and relevant comparisons between the SGAP flap group and other gluteal flap, flap group was completed. All of our patients went through our standardized post-flap mobilization protocol on our dedicated spinal cord injury unit. Of 83 sacral ulcer reconstructions, 15% were SCAP flaps and 85% were other gluteal-based flaps. The SCAP flap was not performed until the year 2007. All of our, our patients were male, para, or quadriplegics of comparable age and BMI. The SCAP flap group had lower rates of active smoking, slightly lower malnutrition rates, but higher diabetes and rates of osteomyelitis. The skin defect was slightly larger in the SCAP group. Prior same-site flap surgery was not performed in the SCAP patients, and operative time was twice as long. Follow-up was over three and a half years in both groups. The most common complication was minor suture line dehiscence as expected. Major dehiscence requiring return to the operating room, hematoma, and infection were quite rare, and sacral ulcer recurrence was relatively low at 16.5% compared to 23 in the other uh, flap group. Um, these rates are comparable to those in the literature. The SCAP flap is therefore a safe, reliable option for reconstruction of sacral ulcer defects and, I argue, should be included in the current reconstructive surgeon's armamentarium. Just for review, a clear understanding of the perforator anatomy and perforosome concept is essential. The perforators emerging cranial to the piriformis muscle and lateral to the SGA exit site should be identified and marked. As seen in this CT angiogram of an SCAP flap from St. Cyr et al., uh, large linking vessels do branch peripherally from the, each perforator in predominantly a lateral direction, connecting the adjacent perforosomes together, which we want to capture. The skin paddle orientation should therefore be transverse and oblique in line with these linking vessel orientation. The, ra the flap should be raised in the superior margin in the subfascial plane first to identify the perforators and then incise the inferior border. Split the gluteus muscle in line with its fibers to allow intramuscular dissection uh, toward the best perforators um, from their origin. One perforator is typically adequate, and lateral perforators are best as they provide the longest pedicle and torsion-free inset, allowing for transfer of soft tissue from more distant non-traumatized zone. Thank you. So wait a second. So I've been informed, are you Lieutenant Commander Kemp? Yes, I am. Lieutenant Commander Kemp. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There you go. Oh, I got, oh, I got okay. you. The dog So I also got another text from the UW guys, which are sort of. So they said the dubs. Now it turns out that the dog is named Dub. That is the dog's name, but it is not the mascot's name. It is Harry. That is his name. Actually, his name would be Harry the Husky. Dub is the name of that particular dog, but he moves on. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant Commander Kemp. You win because from that standpoint. So we got it from there. Next one's up. So, uh, Dr. Ashley Torburn, negative pressure dressing over free muscle flap, six year experience. All right, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. 
We have no financial disclosures. So negative pressure dressings have been uh, routinely used over skin grafts as bolsters for many years. However, they've been avoided in free flaps due to the concern for flap survival. Um, the purpose of our study was to review the cases in which negative pressure dressings were used to cover muscle flaps, free muscle flaps, and skin grafts. We performed a retrospective review of 87 patients over a nine-year period. The age range is from four to 85 years old. The majority of our flaps were gracilis and latissimus, with the majority of our wounds being in the lower extremity. The uh, free flap was performed, and you can see here a gracilis to the lower extremity, uh, followed by a split thickness skin graft that was split thickness skin graft that was meshed and placed over the flap, and then we placed uh, blue sutures to mark the Doppler sites. Next, we placed a non-adherent uh, surface between the skin graft itself and the vac sponge, and then the vac sponge was cut to the exact shape of the flap and um, slightly wider than the flap to prevent tension on it. We then created two windows over the uh, blue sutures to mark the Doppler signals in order to adequately monitor the flap with Doppler, um, and we now actually make these windows slightly larger to facilitate visual inspection as well. On post-op day five, the, uh, the, gra the vac is removed and the skin graft is assessed. So perceived advantages of this are that it optimizes the survival of the skin graft and it does so by reducing shearing and fluid collection. Uh, it also seems to minimize flap edema and it keeps the operative site clean and it certainly simplifies the nursing care and assessment of the flap. Our series had a total flap failure rate of 8% with one additional case with distal flap necrosis and a very large latissimus. Um, it is important, however, to note that in those cases of flap failure, one patient dangled his foot on post-op day three, one patient removed the splint and rested on his flap, one patient rolled over onto the flap, and a fourth patient thrashed and avulsed the pedicle. Uh, so th only three of these flaps actually failed due to thrombosis, and therefore about 3.4% of these can even potentially be attributed to the vac itself. We have a four-year-old male here with a lawnmower injury to the foot with exposed tendon. We performed a free gracilis, and then you can see at uh, five weeks post-operative, uh, the patient had excellent contour. Here's the case of a 74-year-old male with a leg degloving injury. We performed a large latissimus free flap, again doing a skin graft in the vac post-operatively, and you can see that he had just some uh, minimal distal flap necrosis. So in conclusion, the VAC seems to be safe based on our high success rate in this series. We have no reason to attribute the flap or graft failures to the VAC. Monitoring through the dressing is not impaired by this technique, and it definitely eases the post-op care. Some caveats are that it is an uncontrolled series, um, and it's really truly impossible to know for sure that the VAC doesn't at least marginally affect the perfusion of the flap. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Before you go. Yes, sir. So, which, are you from University of Alabama, Birmingham, or University of Texas, because you have both of those? University of Alabama. So, University of Alabama, Birmingham, though, yes, what sir. is their mascot? It's, are you asking me or the, me? Um, the blazer? You, the, bla <laughs> that's right. you know. the blazing dragons, right? The blazing dragons. The blazing yes, dragons. There we yes. go, along with the longhorns. Okay, you're yes, in Texas. Sir. Great. Thanks so Thank much. You. That's great. She knew that, so that's great. That's wonderful. Uh, is that me? Yep. So the next one is uh, from Beth Israel Deaconess. So I don't know, again, we don't have a mascot there, but it is the Methodists and the Jews actually coming together in uh, Beth Israel and Deaconess. So it'll be interesting. I don't know what a minion is, actually, when you go with that sort of thing. It'll be interesting. Cost analysis of two-staged implants with alloderm and deep inferior epigastric perforator flap, autologous reconstruction, bio nagak Tran. Did I do that? Did I kill it? Or? It's Bao Tran. Uh, it's close see, enough. That's so sweet. Just, my Vietnamese is just not that great, you know. Okay, uh, go for Thank that. you for the opportunity to present this study. Um, I have no disclosure. Um, a little bit of background. The rate of post mastectomy breast reconstruction has doubled in the last decade, from 20% to 40%. The rate of autologous reconstruction remains steady, despite a 200% increase in, in implant-based reconstruction. There has been multiple hypotheses um, that try to explain such phenomenon, including the lack of sur skilled surgeon, a longer operating time, and poorer reimbursement rate. We aim to see um, if the, the last hypothesis hold true by uh, performing a comprehensive cost analysis comparing these two types of reconstruction, uh, taking into account both baseline costs as well as pool complication costs. We were able to get our baseline costs using CT-based Medicare reimbursement. Our pool complication cost was calculated by first performing a comprehensive literature review uh, from which we um, 
extrapolated complication rates, and we were able to calculate expected costs associated with each complication each complication, as well as each type of reconstruction. Um, uh, comparing, our two co uh, comparing our two cohorts, we found that the deep flap patient cohort tend to be uh, more obese and have a higher incidence of radiation therapy. Our complication uh, considered for this study including uh, cellulitis, seroma, hematoma, skin necrosis, specific to implant-based reconstruction with capsular contracture and implant explantation, specific to deep flap reconstruction were flap loss, partial flap loss, and fat necrosis. Our analysis show that at baseline, two-stage implant-based reconstruction with ADM was more expensive, both with the expected cost and actual cost. And when we factor in the complication rate, um, this finding hold, held true. 13, 000, about 14,000 for two-stage implant with ADM and 11,400 for DFLAP reconstruction. We concluded that DFLAP reconstruction incur lower costs compared to two-stage with ADM, and the cost was lower at baseline and one additional cost from pool complication was factored in. Um, there was a few um, limitations to the study. First, this is a cost analysis. We did a preliminary cost utility and effectiveness, which show similar result. Our calculation is from Medicare reimbursement, would tend to underestimate the true cost. However, this is the only consistent and publicly available source of reimbursement for, re for uh, reconstruction. Thank you. All right, just within three seconds. Good job. That's just excellent. So, so Dr. Fiorello on pediatric orbital floor fluctures and radiological predictors of tissue entrapment and, and uh, effect on operative timing right. and ocular outcomes. What do you think, Joseph? Boston Children's. We're going to say Harvard, right? So they're going to be crimson? Yes, it's crimson. Although it turns out like the, uh, the, the mascot that visits the most there is actually the green monster. So you could either be crimson or green, but it sounds like it's, it's all colors. I'll, I'll stick with crimson today. That's, all what right. thought, that's what I thought it was. Let's so. stick with Harvard. There you go. I don't blame you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to present this research. Uh, we have no disclosures. Uh, so pediatric orbital floor fractures are quite unique. Children have uh, very elastic bones, predisposing them to the trapdoor variety of fracture. Um, and this largely accounts for the higher rates of tissue entrapment in children compared to adults. Uh, this can result in the ocular cardiac reflex with bradycardia, syncope, nausea and vomiting, and the potential for hemodynamic instability, um, and can also uh, result in poor ocular outcomes. So um, diplopia, AOM restriction, and uh, CT are all well-established screening methods for tissue entrapment. Um, however, in children, a lack of cooperation can be problematic in patient assessment, um, and physical examination can be complicated uh, by false positives due to pain and edema. Uh, as for CT, accessibility and exposure to ionizing radiation remain important issues. Surgical timing is also controversial. Uh, while some people assert that um, it's very important to do an urgent operation, others have found no benefit to this at all. Uh, so we did a retrospective review of our patients um, aged less than 18 years um, that presented to our institution between 2007 and 2015. Uh, in total, we reviewed 152 patients with 159 fractures. Uh, 12 had confirmed tissue entrapment, uh, 12 had trapdoor fractures, and 15 had a radiological impression um, of tissue entrapment on their facial CT. Uh, so if you look at this table here, you can see that EOM restriction and diplopia have a high sensitivity and a high negative predictive value. So put simply, they're great screening tools for ruling out entrapment. Uh, but we can see similar values for nausea and vomiting. And in fact, screening for nausea and or vomiting is essentially just as good at ruling out entrapment um, as diplopia is. Um, facial CT identified all cases of entrapment um, as seen by the 100% sensitivity. Um, and radiological impression of trapdoor fractures, although specific, lack sensitivity. Um, all 12 of our patients uh, were operated on uh, with entrapment and within 24 hours, and the median operation time was one hour, uh, 13 minutes. We followed our patients for an average of 6.2 months. Um, none of the entrapment patients had an ophthalmos at follow-up. However, four had EOM restriction and or diplopia. Um, importantly, these were not correlated or associated with uh, the interval between presentation to operation, 
um, but they were statistically significantly associated uh, with tissue entrapment and uh, with the length of operation. So in conclusion, nausea and vomiting are valuable predictors of tissue entrapment, great for ruling out entrapment. Um, and operation length is associated with ocular outcomes, so maybe there's some importance here um, in case severity, complexity, and surgical technique and experience. Thank you. All right, Joseph. Thanks. Right, Thanks a lot. Excellent work. So the next one, back-to-back uh, -back Harvard affiliated hospitals here. So Crimson, atypical proliferative lesions after reduction mammoplasty, incidents and implications in 993 reductions. Dr. Amy S. Colwell. Is that right? That's right. Thank right. You. You, you. So you had uh, right Boston Children's, and now you got Massachusetts General. So there's a little bit of between sort of intra-rivalry. So yeah. that three minutes will be amazingly embarrassing if you can't match children's very hospital, embarrassing. right? Yeah, yeah. All right, no pressure on you. All Go right, ahead. No pressure. <laughs> Uh, and I have no relevant disclosures. Uh, symptomatic macromastia impairs the quality of life. Patients have pain in their back, shoulders, neck. They get deep uh, bra strap grooves and rashes underneath the breast. Breast reduction relieves the symptoms. And this is a patient example shown here using a typical inferior pedicle wise pattern. In addition, it's considered sort of a large breast biopsy because all the tissue is evaluated by pathology. Unfortunately, occasionally we detect an occult breast carcinoma. Um, the range is anywhere between 0.6 and 4% in the literature. I did a study over a decade ago with uh, Dennis Orgel, and we found an incidence of about 0.8%. Typically, the treatment for these patients is mastectomy because you have really no orientation to um, the overall pathology. Fewer studies have investigated the incidence and, importantly, the implications of atypical proliferative lesions of the breast. So we did a retrospective review at Mass General Hospital of 993 breast reductions. We divided them into three groups, including normal, APL, which is a proliferative lesions, and DCS, or invasive cancer. For APL, we considered hyperplasia, atypical hyperplasia, atypia, dysplasia, and LCIS. So what we found is that we had 148 atypical proliferative lesions for about 12%. The incidence of cancer was about 2%. Not surprisingly, there was an increase for the atypical and carcinomous resection with unilateral procedures, prior breast cancer, and prior radiotherapy. There was no association with overall resection weight. We did a multiple variable uh, regression analysis for cancer, and there were such few numbers, we didn't have a lot of significant findings, but we did have an association of age with cancer. When we did a multivariable regression analysis for proliferative lesions, we found age, prior radiotherapy, and prior breast cancer to be significantly associated with detecting an atypical proliferative lesion. There was a trend source significance with increasing BMI and smoking, and again, resection weight was no really correlation. This is really the most important slide. What happens to these patients with proliferative lesions? Well, in 51 patients who had a prior history of breast cancer, about a third of them had a change in their management. So they had increased surveillance, hormonal therapy, and surgery. If they had no uh, prior history of cancer, the instance is about the same. About a third of them had a change in their management. And so uh, the, in conclusion, proliferative lesions of the breast may be more, commonly, more common than previously reported. Age and history of breast cancer obviously are associated. And then importantly, all lesions have to be referred for oncological evaluation because their treatment can often be altered. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> so we, while the last paper is coming up, I just want to give you a little point of reference. You know, we started this about four years ago, and I, hopefully it's a lot of fun for everybody, but it was ready to get a lot more young people and get a little more papers on the on this area, there's area. And I'll just tell you, Steve Arian, when he first said it, there was no way we were going to come in on time because we have that black tie celebration for the president and for uh, Dr. Zins, and it's going to be wonderful tonight. We're coming well in under, so I want to congratulate all of the speakers for doing a great job. It's just wonderful. So we're going to finish that. Let's have a hand for them. Of course, this puts pressure on you. You've got to finish up strong. But no matter what, for the people that are actually sort of getting ready, you can wait for their tux and so on. The bar is open till 6.30, although this is not a libation section. All right, you didn't hear that from me. So we're going to go to the last one. You want to introduce? Sure. It's a comparison of open versus endoscopic carpal tunnel in the same patient. Nittany Lyons, Penn State, another Big Ten. Let's take us home, okay? All right. All right. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to present. I have no disclosures. Carpal tunnel syndrome is the most common peripheral nerve entrapment of the upper extremity, and open carpal tunnel release is the gold standard of treatment. The open technique is effective and safe, but the endoscopic technique was developed in order to provide a minimally invasive approach. 
Some randomized trials suggest less postoperative pain, faster improvement in grip and pinch strength, and earlier return to work with this technique. The goal of our study was to prospectively examine subjective and functional outcomes, satisfaction, and complications after both endoscopic and open releases in the opposite hands of the same patient serving as their own control. This was a prospective randomized study in which patients diagnosed with bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome underwent surgical release with both techniques. Demographic data were obtained and objective outcome measures were recorded preoperatively and postoperatively at weeks 2, 4, 8, and 12. Overall satisfaction on a scale of 0 to 100 with comments for each procedure were also recorded at the end of the, at the, end of the study. There were 30 patients that completed this study. Independent sample t-tests were conducted between endoscopic and open procedures at each time point. There was no significant differences seen in visual analog pain scores, two-point discrimination, Semmes-Weinstein monofilament testing, or in strength between the two groups. Both the endoscopic and the open groups showed improvement in their carpal tunnel syndrome symptom severity scores, and uh, this was seen at between their preoperative and all postoperative time points. There was also improvement, but again, no significant difference seen in carpal tunnel syndrome functional status scores between the two groups. Finally, overall satisfaction was also not significantly different. Interestingly, 17 patients reported equal satisfaction scores for both techniques, but when asked which they prefer, 24 patients did report the endoscopic approach. They cited subjectively less pain as their reason for choosing that technique. This study did not find a benefit to the use of one technique over the other for patients with carpal tunnel syndrome requiring surgical release. Both techniques are well tolerated with no differences in measurable objective outcomes. There was also no significant difference found in the comparison of final patient satisfaction scores at the conclusion of the study. The ability to perform open carpal tunnel surgery wide awake and in a clinic setting has led the senior author to move back towards performing the open carpal tunnel release for the majority of his patients. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for a wonderful session. So we, the bar is open for about another 15 minutes. I want to encourage everybody to get these young investigators and talk to them back there, have it uh, talk over the beers and so on. On behalf of Avika, Stephen, and I, we thank you for attending the session, which I think was great. And let's go celebrate at the Black Tie Dinner. Good night. Right. Reconvene at 7 o'clock.